Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisick. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government and industry leaders in securing cyberspace. With me today on the show are Rear Admiral Marshall Lytle, the commander of the Coast Guard Cyber Commands and the CIO of the Coast Guard, Roger Clark, the Acting Director, Office of Cybersecurity, Acting Chief Information Security Officer, Department of Commerce, Major General Earl Matthews, Vice President Enterprise Solutions, HP Enterprise Services. David O'Berry, the Worldwide Strategic Technology at the Office of the CTO for Intel Security. And, and Paul Chrisman, the Vice President, Dell Software Public Sector. Let's talk a little bit about security. Um, obviously, cybersecurity has been dominating the news lately. And uh, we've heard about our share of problems and, and issues and breaches and on and on and on. But what I really want to focus on a little bit now is let's talk about progress we're making addressing those issues and things that we're doing and progress being made to address some of these vulnerabilities and threats that are out there. Let's start with uh, Admiral Lytle. Uh, Admiral, can you talk a little bit about some of the progress you see at Coast Guard in addressing some of these issues? Sure. Uh, first, I like to take the cybersecurity concept and bump it up a level. Okay. It's really about cyber operations, of which cybersecurity is a part of that. And recognize that cyber is an operational domain, and it's not just about security. It's an area that we all work in, and all our business functions in, and the military stuff goes on in. So we have to start from there and work, work, work uh, downward. Uh, the second thing from the Coast Guard point of view is real we realize that we need to know where we're going. If we're going to do the cyber operations thing, we really need to know where are we going to go with it. So we spent a lot of time working with U.S. Cyber Command, working with DOD, working with DHS to come up with what's the Coast Guard strategy in cyber. Where should we go in strategy? Where should we go in cyber? We came up with three main goal areas. So we recently published the strategy a couple months ago. Three main goal areas are to defend our own piece of the network. The mm -hmm. Coast Guard is part of the DODIN. We're part of Correct. the .mil. Second one is to enable operations. We really need to look at where we can use cyber to enable our Coast Guard operations across the board. And the third is protecting the maritime infrastructure. Part of our mission set is to protect the maritime industry, the maritime transportation industry. We really look forward to working with the industry to help define how we can help protect their infrastructure so that we can ensure the safety of our maritime transportation system. Wow, terrific. I really like that second one, too, where you say enable operations, because I think in the past people viewed security as sort of like, you know, saying no. Um, I like the view it more as security being find out a way to enable things to be done securely. Um, Roger Clark, how about over at Department of Commerce? Can you give us some ideas of where you're making some progress in uh, addressing some of these key issues that we're hearing about? Well, I have to agree totally with the Admiral you that operational, we've for a long time said that we have to operationalize cybersecurity and get away from the old compliance mode mm -hmm. and how do you start measuring the effectiveness of what your cybersecurity program is doing. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a major challenge uh, and trying to move to the, the NIST risk uh, management framework so that it's that continuous uh, assessment of how your systems are doing and it's enabling the mission to do their job. And commerce is a holding company in, in essence sure. with all of the different mission sets that Absolutely. are across the department. Absolutely. And it takes a lot of different areas that we have to do. So it's, you can't do the one size fits all for all of the different bureaus uh, with, under the Department of Commerce. So trying to get those to fit into uh, a centralized sort of a, a command structure so at least you have situational awareness at the headquarters level, but the operational units have their own uh, battles to fight and defend their own networks. Yeah, and a good point you're making there is that continuous assessment. I think, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, we've solved the cybersecurity issue. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there, there's always a next thing and, and a next threat and, and a newer vulnerabilities popping up left and right. Um, Major General Earl Matthews uh, over at HP. How is HP positioning to support your customers and to address some of these tough issues out there now that are obviously have, ra have risen to top priorities for the country? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, we really believe that uh, effective security posture is one that really permeates an organization's culture. And that includes their people, their processes, their technology, and their governance. And we have a number of security and privacy portfolio offerings that really help governments get themselves positioned to do that. And being a multinational company, we help, help lots of governments, not just our, our own. Um, as far as um, 
helping them really understand and comprehend what's happening on the cyber landscape, what are those risk predictions that they can do. And sometimes for our, many of our organizations, it's really about getting them the right information at the right time to, for decision making. So we offer a complete array of uh, cybersecurity portfolio, whether it's just basic managed security services, identity management, compromise assessment, uh, incident response. Um, it just, you know, yeah. it really is the yeah, whole, the, whole the gamut. This goes on. It I does. taught cybersecurity at the, at the graduate level, and one thing we did, and actually uh, the admiral mentioned it too, just the scope of what you're talking about. Cybersecurity is, you know, a much bigger thing than just any one of those particular matters. And what we're seeing from our customers, it's a varying degree of improvement. The trend is up, mm -hmm. but the, the vectors keep changing, the attack vectors keep changing. But Absolutely. We see, you know, really good pockets from uh, internal services. Right. Yeah. And in fact, I think the bad guys, you know, know what's going on too. So they're constantly trying to, every time the good guys come out with a fix, you know, the bad guys are trying to figure out the ways to get around those fixes. Uh, Paul Chrisman over Dell Software, can you give us a little bit, uh, uh, tell us how Dell plays in this? Sure. And how do you guys, uh, you know, Yeah, Jim, this? Um, I think Dell has a, has a position much like HP and Intel as, as both a provider of the technology that uh, public sector agencies use to achieve security. But I think at Dell, we take a different approach and we say part of our mission for our public sector customers is to ensure everything that we provide has security built into it from the get-go. It's got to be built in. So that's everything from a sec uh, secure supply chain integrity for uh, our uh, products offered to the public sector, as well as making sure that the products connect to each other and provide sort of a connected and layered security. Depending on where you start your relationship with our organization, you should be able to build from that, whether it's our server products and, again, looking at supply chain integrity to guarantee that the products that the government uh, purchases are compliant with the regulations there, all the way through to the services and software that we provide to actually achieve the security mission of the agency. Um, sort of to, to expand a little bit on uh, what Admiral Lytle said, we actually take security operations up a level, mm -hmm. and we talk about general security, and, and one of the things that we're actually pleased to help with is bridging the gap between cybersecurity and physical security, which is a big push yeah, lately. I, I actually think that issue is, it, it has merged together, like telecom and data processing have merged together. It's all I mean, the same It's thing. hard to talk about one, yeah. not the other, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The IT and OT aspects. Uh, as there well. you go. There you go. And, uh, and I like your point. Getting proactive. I still sometimes just me just me talking here. Think the government's still a bit reactive. I mean, the Congress is going to take action after something bad happens, and you know, and, uh, and I think we got to change that mindset, you know, in order to get out in front of folks. Um, you had a comment there. Um, yeah, Jim. And I think the reason why we see a lot of government organizations operate that way is because they're still dealing with legacy infrastructure and legacy applications, Good right? So they're focused. And then when you add in the FISMA regulations, they're focused on reporting back on those kind of things and not being more uh, operational. Yeah. Good point. Good point. David Barry um, uh, over at Intel, tell us a little bit how the kinds of things you're doing to support addressing some of these, you know, critical uh, issues in cybersecurity. Sure, sure. So I think um, actually enablement of, uh, of standards data interchange for security um, we have something called a data exchange layer, which, uh, which Intel has now um, put forward as, as, as going to be a standard um, for just, you know, it comes from an Internet of Things uh, mm -hmm. a background. Standard MQTT. for the country? Or? Well, just a standard, actually, that will be out there that people can write to. So, like, our partners are, are writing to it now, but it's going to be open um, for folks to actually be able to write to it, uh, to be able to interchange even for people that we call, you know, coopetition or, you know, mm -hmm. we've, you sure. know I don't, Intel doesn't really look at anybody as a competitor necessarily because a lot of folks use our stuff, right? So um, Intel Security Group might. Um, right. But I, I think that the enablement of the tip of the spear goes to directly what uh, Admiral's talking about, how their, their strategic plan itself um, and, you know, if you're doing something in cybersecurity that is not uh, directly related back to your strategic plan as an organization, then why are you, why are you doing it? Excellent point. So I think that alignment is, is, is also where we can help. Um, I think sometimes the folks um, believe, you know, that a bunch of different solutions kind of make you more secure. But I think the issue is that you have to make sure that you have a, a tightly integrated management aspect, a tightly integrated operational aspect to be able to get that visibility to do things in real time now. You were talking about proactive, and I do believe we've been very reactive uh, in a lot of situations, and there's no silver bullet. You know, I mean, I, I, I will say that over and over again. If someone comes to you and tells you they can solve all of your security problems, then more than likely that's not accurate. Uh, but what I do believe is that when you start to look at, like, the operational aspect of things, that you can't um, you can't expect to, you know, 
you know, do one thing and create it. But you can standardize a lot of these things sure. uh, to make them to where you don't have to spend time on all of the all of the white noise that you were having to before. I think sometimes we spend a lot of you know issues on just going back yeah. and doing all that. Yeah, I think challenges for industry are you know as we move to cloud and do everything else is to stop back and reflect and let's look at all the band-aid approaches we've taken for the last 20 years, yes, and let's look at comprehensive security and you know look at it as a totally different way to look at it. You know, forget about this idea that every time we have an incident we're going to come out with a patch and we're going to come out with. Let's step back and say how can we secure the environment, you right. know, and maybe we can get rid of a whole lot of that old stuff. Well, look at, and look at, look at the situation, actually. We were talking about um, in the military, some of the DOD folks, you know, how many applications they're getting rid of as they move to the cloud. Sure. I always say, don't take an application and put it into the cloud until you're sure that that application should be in the cloud. Uh, Absolutely. An app Appli a bad <laughs> application here becomes a really bad application in the cloud. Application inventory should be a first step in moving <laughs> to the cloud. Let's, uh, let's talk about specific programs. Uh, our audience always likes to hear, you know, uh, okay, well, you're making progress, but can you give us a specific example of something you're doing in your area that really you believe is making a difference. So let's start with Roger Clark this time over at the Department of Commerce. I know I hear a lot about your Security Operations Center and, uh, and things you're, you're doing there. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know well, specific programs? Actually, I'm really proud that uh, actually uh, ahead of schedule that we've actually delivered a program um, for our Enterprise Security Operations Center. We've uh, co-located with our, uh, one of our uh, sister uh, organizations with uh, NOAA, mm -hmm. and that's allowed us to provide a shared situational awareness across both uh, of those organizations because they are the largest holder of our critical infrastructure within the department. They move a lot of data via they satellite. They do move a lot of data, and it also okay. allowed us to consolidate at one of their tick points, so mm -hmm. that, that's also an advantage. Uh, what this has provided us is shared situational awareness across the entire department. We, that's something we've never had before. Uh, and a, a recent example is actually this week, we saw a phishing attack go to two organizations within the department simultaneously. And what we've been able to do is tie our sensor grid together. And we had that and was able to push that out to all of the bureaus within the department in near real time. Yeah. yeah. So that that's a, a major accomplishment that yeah. we've had. And, and the catch that, you know, because I mean, <clears throat> I've got a lot of issues uh, around cybersecurity that that uh, that I, I think there's still vulnerabilities out there. And one of them is with, with all these breaches and all the OPM breaches, all that data, phishing attacks are sort of inevitable. They're going to come. Right. I mean, that's the next step. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, with all that with that data out there, people are going to get all kinds of sca either scammers or nation states are going to, to try to do whatever they can to, with that data. Another key point that we did is uh, actually the first of the year, we consolidated all of our incident reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, previously, our larger organizations reported directly to U.S. CERT, and we didn't really have visibility at the department level of those incidents that were going on. So we've consolidated now, and that's all, again, on the same watch floor, so we have that awareness across the department, because it's not a, uh, a good situation if right. uh, the boss finds out about an incident and uh, the, the CIO <laughs> or I don't know about it. So, uh, <laughs> so exactly we, right. that, never works, that never works out well. <laughs> um, uh, Admiral Lytle, uh, let's talk about maybe a specific program at Coast Guard that you think is really making a difference and is going to really help uh, improve the security posture at Coast Guard. Well, we started off, uh, we actually changed our Coast Guard organization to accommodate cyber. Similar to what the Department of Defense did, we created a Coast Guard Cyber Command, a, a unit specifically to address cyber operations in, in the entire cyber domain. And the key part of this is it is a separate entity that works for our Deputy Commandant for Operations. Okay. So it's on the mission side of the house, separate from the CIO function, which is under the support side of the house. Okay. So we've split those two to recognize the place that cyber has in business and mission operations. And the distinction is it's kind of a, there's always a gray area between, but in the CIO side of the house, it's all about providing and maintaining the systems that we work with. Right. On the cyber side of the house, it's all about operating and defending those systems. Okay. So we've made that distinction to put cyber over in the operation side and create a command specifically oriented to manage that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, that puts the focus out there and you know, creates the, the visibility, I think, and the credibility around this and sends a message. This is important. It's all about the operation. 
aspirational mission. Absolutely. Uh, David O'Berry, um, let's talk about a specific program. Give me a specific that you've seen out there or something you're doing to support your customers that you think is going to make a big difference. So, uh, again, I will go back to uh, the data exchange layer. And simply because in the situation what we're hearing is don't reinvent the wheel. You know, so I think that a lot of times um, folks have kind of been their own special snowflake or, or felt like that they were, you know, special and they wanted to create their right. own thing and put their name on it. But now what we're seeing is a lot more sharing, a lot more of the situations where you have to get to near real time, as you spoke about, or real time, or even predictive and proactive before, you know, uh, when it comes down to it. I think that um, what's happened is, is that with data exchange layer, in real time, you can exchange information across, uh, across the boundaries of any of these any of these companies with other organizations with us, these types of things. So I think that um, when you look at the ability to do that in real time uh, and in a standard way, you no longer have to worry about do I have this vendor or did I create my own security widget or whatever that, because there are going to be specific things that you can actually contribute to that security bus that we won't have, contextual aspect. We have global threat intelligence for what we do. But your local threat intelligence is really critical to what you guys do. And so basically, when we tie that together, with a, we have an actual product called Tie, believe it or not, called um, when you tie the global threat. <laughs> I know, right? That's very cool. The marketing. <laughs> I know. I, I, I kind of push for ticks and tacks, but they didn't really like that. So uh, <laughs> tie die. Um, but uh, but when, the, when you looked at that, matter of fact, I like that tie, by the way. <laughs> but when you look at that aspect and you mix the global threat intelligence and that local threat intelligence, that joint threat intelligence right there. That's the magic. Because now when you look at DXL and things like that, now you can actually do self-immunization. Right. Um, you don't have to worry about submitting m a malware samples up into the cloud or, or up to an someone else. You can actually do that stuff in real time in your own organization. And that's cool. pretty powerful. Very cool. Uh, Earl Matthews, what do you think? What's a specific yeah. program you think that it, that you're working that's going to really you know make a difference here? Yeah, Jim, I think there are two. And then one okay. of them was recently a, a show that you had on, with DHS talking about continuous diagnostics yeah, and cool. mitigation. Yeah. Right, and the Department of Defense has a similar program. It's not actually a program, but a similar effort called the Joint Information Environment, in which they are, you know, coming together with common security architectures because the services didn't have that before. And I had the pleasure of working that with Marshall uh, in the Pentagon while I was on active duty. Cool. But really trying to get, you know, standardized on tools, how you manage, how you measure the risk, how you bring in the threat intelligence. You know, we see good efforts over at FAA and Postal in that in that arena. Yeah, terrific. Uh, Paul Christman, uh, Paul, what can you uh, throw on the table here as to, uh, you know, a specific program that you think you're working that's going to really, uh, you know, help make some improvements in addressing the critical issues we're talking about? Well, I, I'd, I'd sort of dovetail on all of the comments so far, but also talk about the idea that the most successful programs are not mandates. And most of the items that we see as successful, whether it's the CDM programs out of DHS or the NIST programs on the cybersecurity uh, framework, they're not mandates. And one of the things that I th think is, is really impressive and also healthy is that we're, we're looking at recommendations. And those recommendations are applied to the particular mission, the agency, the vulnerabilities, the data. They look at things in, in a different way rather than saying, thou shalt do X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, a bad FISMA report or an OIG report right. or something like that. But it's the idea that they're recommendations. And we're moving into a consultative, cooperative arrangement. We'll, we'll choose DHS and CDM. DHS and CDM are now viewed not as the hammer, but they're viewed as the experts that can be called in potentially after a breach or, or an incident. And that idea of cooperation rather than uh, mandate and I told you so is really a healthy change. And it's being manifested in several areas. And again, the NIST uh, framework and the CDM uh, 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 contract through DHS are both really healthy uh, developments in the industry. Yeah. Well, and the bad guys are sharing, so we definitely need to be sharing. <laughs> well, yeah, collaboration, <laughs> collaboration, information sharing clear, clearly has to be forefront. But the uh, and uh, and also, you know, I think the, the mandates are you know good and focus and attention. But you can't say, okay, well, we went from X percentage on uh, uh, two-factor authentication to X percentage. So okay, good, we did a good job. Now we're now we can relax. Right. You know, we can't relax. There's a lot of other things that need to be addressed. And I agree with you. And, and in fact, testified in Congress a number of times on. I was never very popular testifying on FISMA. I, <laughs> I said filling out those forms and those checklists never solved any security, uh, cyber security it's problems. Um, so compliance does not equal security. Yeah. I used to also tell our secretary that he'd say, well, we got a D. And I'd say, you don't understand, sir. D means dollars. D is good. <laughs> if you get an A, you don't get any money. You get a yeah. D. <laughs> um, all right. Let's, um, uh, we're going to switch and talk a little bit here about some lessons learned and challenges and so forth.
But first, we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Admiral Marshall Lytle from Coast Guard, Roger Clark from Commerce, Earl Matthews from HP Enterprise Services, David O'Berry from Intel Security, and Paul Christman from Dell Software public sector. We're talking uh, cybersecurity. We've talked about some progress, some specific uh, programs that are that are making a difference. And let's talk about some lessons learned. There's a lot of people, a lot of your colleagues, a lot out there working these issues now. And I'm sure that we, everyone learns some things along the way. What we'd like to do is, you know, talk a little bit about some of the lessons you're learning as you're addressing these issues that, uh, you know, may be helpful to uh, to others as they work these same issues. Let's start with uh, Admiral Ladle again. Ad Admiral, tell us about some of the lessons you're learning as you're working through the cybersecurity pro initiatives. Well, two key ones that I can think of right off the bat. One is that uh, changing the way we do cybersecurity is an organizational culture change. It's not about a bunch of IT folks in the background making some changes to the computer system or putting the latest, uh, latest version of the antivirus on. It's about changing the culture. Everybody needs to understand that it's part of their job. Just like in the Coast Guard, most people understand aviation safety, they understand small boat safety, they take, account, take that risk management into account when they're doing their job, but they don't think twice about starting to type on the keyboard and not somebody else is taking care right. of that. Right. Everybody needs to be part of this. Everybody operates in the domain. Some We have aviators that fly. We have folks that don't fly. But everybody touches a computer. So everybody needs to understand the culture of we need to think security. The second lesson was about the basics, just cybersecurity basics. Across the organization, from the user on up to the owners of the applications, need to understand the basics of cybersecurity are important. Doing that two-factor authentication, instituting the right systems, keeping the operating systems up to date. Just some basic stuff that'll get our cybersecurity posture up to probably 80% of where it needs to be without getting into the high-tech, high-end stuff. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think, you know, there's some basic cybersecurity 101 things that we got to make sure are in place, you know, and then we'll move on to some of the more, you know, elaborate types of uh, protections. Uh, David, you have a comment on that? I, I think that's fantastic. I'm talking about the blocking and tackle aspect of things, right? Sometimes that goes by the wayside. It's like we had, when we had the Ebola scare, how many people started washing their hands for the two happy birthday, you know, happy birthday right. to me. Right. So I think a lot of times we don't really pay attention to that exact situation because we don't equate that physical and digital world. Yeah, like absolutely. Be. Great point, great point. Roger, Roger Clark, what do you think? Uh, some of the lessons you're learning as you work your way through this uh, morass of issues that we're working with these days. <laughs> well, the biggest thing I've actually learned personally is that communications with your stakeholders is the key, especially when you're working with a diverse set of mission sets, uh, getting them to get the organizational buy-in. A lot of the things that we're doing are not overly technologically challenging. It's, they're, they're actually fairly, some of them are pretty straightforward. It is, it's getting that buy-in and managing the stakeholders, managing the expectations, because when you're working across a large organization, things take time. You can't just flip a button uh, it's when you don't have control uh, directly over uh, the dollars or uh, the posture in the uh, mission sets themselves. So that's always been a, a large challenge. It's workforce. You can throw all the technology at cybersecurity that you want, yeah. and if you don't have the people to monitor the screens to understand the data, then all you have is a bunch of screens. So all you, all you have is, uh, uh, you know, that, that's a big challenge, getting the right people in. And that's always been a challenge uh, for us because lots of times, even in uh, trying to go to the contractor world, uh, we don't have the sexy mission. DOD and the Intel community have the sexy mission, uh, especially with uh, being able to do offensive operations potentially. And we don't really have that. And so it's sometimes we had to battle to try to get those uh, really high class uh, or, or high skilled folks yeah. on board. Oh yeah, the, the, the competition for skilled folks in this area is intense right across the board, not just in government, government industry, industry with government and so forth and so forth. And both, in, interesting that your lessons learned both dealt with, you know, non-technical issues, uh, the workforce and what, and, uh, and Admiral, you mentioned the term culture and I just have to, uh, to it, this is show 125. 
This is the 125th show. The word culture has entered the equation as being an, an, an issue or a lesson in terms of uh, uh, things. You know, I think we ought to have, like, a, you guys are too young, but that old Groucho Marx show where you, you mention a secret word and something comes down. I think I, <laughs> culture, would, culture would work every time. Um, uh, uh, Paul Christman, uh, give us some lessons learned as you're, uh, you know, working your way through this. I think one of the things that we've recognized, and we've said it before, is that there is no silver bullet. Um, I was really, really discouraged, actually, when uh, the OPM breach happened and the Senate hearings were going on. And they said, well, if you had just implemented encryption, all of this would have been solved, right? Yeah. Well, the answer is obviously no. I, I think that the idea of having connected and layered security is imperative. It's not simple. But the, the thing that we, we have learned is the consequences of compromised credentials. And I think one of the things that we always are fighting against is we imagine there's some black hat hacker someplace overseas. That's a, that's a true and valid threat. <clears throat> but the idea of being able to manage our own identities within the sphere of our own influence and the operational uh, aspects that we have now, we owe it to ourselves to control what we can control. Yeah. And that idea of compromised credentials and the consequences of the damage that can be done when someone uh, takes away a, a systems administrator's uh, ability to function um, and uses those credentials, they, they've basically got the king, uh, keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the lessons learned in how vulnerable we are, but how controllable that risk is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, the Admiral mentioned that, you know, it, it's uh, it's everyone's responsibility. Every individual user has a responsibility when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. And, and even with uh, HSPD 12, PIV cards and all that for remote access, that's fine. But we got to be, even if someone can use their credentials, if you're going to allow downloading of data to remote devices and things like that, you got all kinds of vulnerabilities and still we, there. And if we just look at PIV or CAC adoption as checkbox uh, security, it's not going to work. And one of the big issues that we're looking at now is to say, PIV or CAC, if it's not connected back to the application and, and that application doesn't understand access, sure. not just authentication with the card, but access rights, then it's a false sense of security. Yeah. Sorry, sorry yeah. for the bad. Well, I, I, there's there's technologies out there, and I believe that on the remote access piece, you you have access to your your networks, but the data never leaves the firewall. You get screenshots, but no data. Yeah. Don't, don't allow data to move back and forth. Uh, Earl Earl Matthews, what do you think? What are some of the lessons you're learning here as you work your way through? Yeah, Jim, what we're seeing is that a lot of our customers know what to do. They don't know how to do it. Right, and so it's getting these large-scale implementations of cybersecurity and using a holistic plan to put it together, right? And it really starts at the bottom level with architecture on how the architecture comes together. And one of my biggest fears coming out of this OPM breach is that a lot of government organizations are going to spend money at the end of year on cybersecurity. But is it really in right. accordance with, yeah, yeah. In the, with their overall holistic plan? Uh, the second thing we see is that, you know, everyone's talking Hygiene, hygiene, hygiene is the basic, you know, as David said, blocking and tackling. Still the number, still the number one vector is, you know, uh, spear phishing. So that comes back to people, and are we educating our people <coughs> enough? And I really do believe we need to have a national education cyber campaign that's very robust, that starts at the kindergarten level. You know, I've got two grandkids, you know, and they're mm -hmm. fourth, and they're already using sure. digital so devices, sure. yeah, but we absolutely. don't. And, you know, Montana Williams, you know, was doing a good job over, you know, but it was a small budget. But we really need to have robust, like John F. Kennedy challenged the nation to go to space. We need more rocket scientists. We need more engineers. And make it a positive, fun thing. But it just needs to be inculcated it's, to our culture. Right. Yep. Right. And it's going to be, you know, as uh, the young kids get into the workplace, they're going to be used to doing things, uh, you're assuming that the security is there. Uh, David, what do you think? Some lessons learned. You're, uh, I, I, absolutely. I think that we're, we're all digital citizens. You know, I mean, in this situation, that cyber thread, that thread of that existence has to be from the time you, you know, pretty much exit. I mean, I would be not surprised that they're handing out, as you leave the maternity ward, iPads at some point in time. You know, I mean, so, you know, this all becomes part of that situation. So I think that, you know, going forward, the, the, the biggest lessons learned is that, you know, down select, create down select situations for you. Don't, don't, you know, you have to have high end operators, but how many of these high end operators can you really go and find? You were talking about the competition for them. So basically encapsulate this stuff as much as possible so that level ones that can get to level threes for you, you know, can, can do a lot of this work without having to go out and find some heroes. I mean, I had a guy named Marshall 
I'll just go back. I've had a number of them, but he would sit in a dark room with five screens and he could do crazy stuff, right? But I couldn't get very many marshals and I got him out of a tech school when he was 20 years old when I was on the, when I was on the customer side. And I didn't want to let my, I didn't want to let no one, <laughs> I didn't, and I didn't want to let anyone know I had Marshall. But so we want to put Marshall in a box, right? And, uh, you know, and automate Marshall. We want robotic Marshall out there. Because I think longer term, this is, you know, if you treat it more like a digital HMO because you are your password. And that's one thing Intel um, is, is very, very keen on is the fact that, you know, when you get down to it, you are your password. This person is, is, is your password. So whether it's facial recognition along with a pin, those types of things together. Um, and at the same time, when you begin to look at, uh, you know, longer term application classification needs to go along with data classification, needs to go along with user classification and those other two. Data classification, we kind of kind of understand. But when you put those three together, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, uh, j just a real fast story about the, the kids today. I got a four-year-old grandson, and uh, he comes walking in the other day with my I iPhone and says, you know, Grandpa, what is your password? Because <laughs> he was frustrated he couldn't get on. <laughs> you don't have your, your compromised credentials. He's, he's, he's four years old. And I, a, a little bit later, a little bit later, my son-in-law uh, gets a text message, and he looks at it, and he says, um, <clears throat> Aiden, are you texting on my phone again? <laughs> so uh, anyway, you're right. Very good points. All right, let's talk. Uh, we've talked now about progress and uh, specific programs, some lessons learned. Some <clears throat> now let's talk about the hard stuff, the challenges that are out there, the things that you, you, you still need to accomplish to get to where you want to go with all this stuff. Uh, let's start with Roger Clark this time, Roger. Roger, when, when you get, what are some of the tough things yet that you still need to you know, get over that hurdle in order to get where you want to be? Still the toughest challenge is breaking down silos uh, th with the different mission sets. Um, and always a, a battle around funding uh, to get the right people, uh, to get the right technologies, I think one of the things that, uh, going back, and it's tying a little bit of the success thing, is with our Enterprise Security Operations Center, we were able to sell that program that I had a flatline budget. Instead of the traditional uh, ramp up of the program and then you tail off to go into O&M, because we were able to, to sell that there's always going to be changes, there's going to be new threat vectors. Nice. So trying to keep up with those. Mm -hmm is also a big challenge, especially with a small staff. So you have to have the diversity across a large organization to be able to tie all of those pieces together for that situational awareness. Funding. How you mean when you put something out there, all your subunits don't immediately sign up and say we're, we're in? <laughs> uh, Remember, I ran Treasury and I had the IRS, and back then, cu Customs was still in Treasury and Secret Service. And, well, so, actually, uh, you I understand. Come back. I, I started to say I think a lot of the bureaus think of me as the IRS because I'm the tax man that uh, levy on them. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I remember plenty of food fights over funding. Um, Admiral Lytle, let's, uh, what are some of the tough things out there yet? The, uh, the challenges, the, 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 th the, the issues you need to get, that, that hurdle you've got to get over to get to where you want to go. We, we've hit on a number of them across, across the board okay. here. Uh, Dave was talking about uh, the no silver bullet. We've got we've to look at the, the range of options here. Uh, that gets back to that culture thing that I think we've all touched on. You right. know, ding for a Absolutely. point for saying Absolutely. culture, right? There you go. But, um, you know, getting folks to not only at the user level understand that, but also at the, the organizational and the government level uh, realization, there's not, you can't just, oh, if you had better security, you could fix that, right? No, it's that multi-layered people, getting people to understand the domain, getting people to understand what it takes, and there's no silver bullet there. Second one that Roger was talking about was the cyber workforce. That is probably one of the most critical things we have as, mm -hmm. as far as the challenge, is that, uh, you know, okay, the, the DOD side does the fun stuff, but the DOD side and the government side in general is not the high the high salary paying market. Absolutely. So it's competing with everybody. There's a very limited uh, number of folks in this skill set that we are all competing for, right. both industry and government. And how do we keep and retain and develop more of that talent? The third area, which, uh, which Roger Alger mentioned, was funding, mm -hmm. resources. You know, we've traditionally funded IT systems to get the, the GUI straight, get the, uh, the user demands in there, get the shiny bells and whistles on the screen, and the security stuff didn't really get built in. And even the model for how we acquire mm -hmm. IT systems has not been such that like we do when we buy a big right. piece of metal, a ship, we plan for 20 years, we build it over 10 or 15, we have a program that goes on for 30 years, we have build in the O&M, whether it's a ship or an aircraft or whatever. IT, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll build it and then it'll be good for 10 years. 
when reality is right. it'll be good for six months. Right. Right. You have to have that continuous flow. And I think mm -hmm. Earl mentioned it in terms of uh, the fallout funds at the end of the year. IT security usually gets, hey, we got 10 bucks at the end of the year, throw it into IT security, you'll be good for another couple of years. It has to be a recurring funding stream right. to accommodate the fact that this domain is not like air, sea, land, and space, which right. generally don't change. Right. We know the physics of it. Right. The cyber domain changes constantly. We have to be able to be flexible enough to accommodate that, change our legacy systems, change our current systems, and adapt that multi-layer security posture. Yeah, all kinds of uh, interesting things are laid in there. I, and I think you're right. If you watch the evolution of the security, cybersecurity <coughs> profession, I know I go way back to when <coughs> the early days. You know, you would pick a, a system programmer who you know looked like the craziest guy in the office and call him the security guy. You know, but you know since then, and boy, it's changed. And I know even teaching at uh, you know w w over the 19 years, early days there'd be you know a few people. Now the courses are you can't even get in them. I mean, because it's become uh, such a such a big deal and um, such a important thing. So the workforce is going to constantly be a a challenge for everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, David O'Berry, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that we're facing? The things that we we really got to find a way to solve in order to get where we really sure. need to be. I think <clears throat> when they talk about workforce, I think actually you also mentioned you need this early childhood education stuff. I think that's actually, there are saviors in a lot of ways, right? So um, it's not a thing you can fix in the next year or two, but I think that, you know, I'll call it little Timmy. You know, if you teach little Timmy, little Timmy will take care of mom and dad and he'll take you know, grandma and grandpa and eventually he'll take care of us all. So, um, but we don't have those early types of education aspects that are interesting. I also think that the military has gotten it so right in so many ways um, uh, for, for how they do operational aspects with OODA loops or Boyd's loops. And I think now, and I've been talking about this for a num 10 years in cybersecurity, people thought I was crazy, but, um, and I may be, but not on this specific topic. Uh, you know, so when you think about these, these OODA loops, it's entirely um, uh, possible that we actually need to actually mix procurement into that aspect as well, which is something I hadn't thought about until you just said that. But this agile and iterative, you know, these eddies of loops that you can actually, you know, observe and reorient as you go. Um, and I think a lot of times folks do kind of throw things at it and say, okay, no, this is static. And we know that we have to be building for mitigation and resilience just like you have in, in the military operations aspect. So you know what, if I get hit here, here's my fallback, here's what my operational capabilities are. Um, and I think we don't really look at it that way because yeah, we're too... Resiliency the resiliency issue. The resiliency issue is huge. That's right, because I think a lot of times you, get, you can't build from, from avoidance. Mm -hmm. You know, you know you're going to take some hits, and now when you take the hits, how do I minimize that, how do I keep the horse in the barn, right. um, or don't let it get too far out of the barn before I turn it into glue? Yeah, it's like, it's like FEMA, to, you know, start at st yeah, we're not going to stop a hurricane. Right. <laughs> it's going to come. That's right. Yeah, we, the digital, that we, is so we need to figure out what is the quickest way to recover. What is the resiliency? And, yeah. you to, and you think about that with cybersecurity. I You're not going to stop every attack. I have so said let's that figure out how we react to it. Plan for the digital hurricane to hit the shore every day. There you go. There you go. We just came up with a very nice analogy. Uh, I want to hear. I want to hear from Paul and Earl on this too. But um, I think uh, we first need to take another short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Admiral Laidall from the Coast Guard, Roger Clark from Commerce, uh, Earl Matthews from HP Enterprise Services. David O'Berry from Intel Security and Paul Chrisman from Dell Software Public Sector. We're talking cybersecurity. We've had a lively discussion around a number of topics here. When we went to break, we were talking uh, about challenges, and we heard from some of our guests, but we haven't heard from uh, Paul and Earl on this. Let's start with Earl. Earl, can you uh, give us some of the, the challenges you see that we really need to address, solve, to get to where we need to be on the, uh, with uh, cybersecurity? Yeah, Jim, I still think the biggest bill coming to OMB has not arrived, and that comes in application security and rationalization. Excellent point. We are just dealing with so many legacy applications, and when we look at the statistics that are being generated, the 84% of the vulnerabilities are coming through applications. And when you look at mobile applications, that jumps to 90%. And on the mobile applications, it's not so much that they're insecure, it's that they haven't turned on their authentication, but the legacy applications for sure were never designed to be consumed on a mobile device, um, be postured to take advantage of moving to the clouds. They all got to be rewritten with the threat modeling in, in mind. And then when we add the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. okay, on top of that, 
because last year was the first year that mobile devices right. have exceeded the desktop as far as consumption of, of doing yeah. workplace work or social media work, whatever it is in our lives. And so we're the security professionals then now are going to start being drowned in data, security mm -hmm. data from all these different sensors. So what's the big data strategy for cybersecurity, mm -hmm. right? So we've seen it on the business side. They're drowning in data. Well, now the, all these sensors that we put on, and Roger kind of talked about it, what's going to happen? So automation is going to be key here. Machine learning is going to be key in order to be able to overcome those challenges. Yeah, there's actually some scary things out there when you hear about, you know, the amount of um, computers and cars these days, and if someone could, you know, hacker can get in there and start fooling around with that, and, and uh, the Internet of Things, you know. Yeah. Um, you just, and we, just, we just had the situation with the recall from Chrysler right. based on the fact, and DEF CON, you know, and they showed it at Black Hat where you could, you know, the guy's three, four miles away sitting on his uh, his uh, sofa and can run it into the ditch. Yeah. So, you know, these are non-trivial life altering things Absolutely. for just even regular citizens at this point, yeah. much less the government. Absolutely. Jim, I think David brought up a really good point earlier about this integration of um, IT and OT, so operational technology, mm -hmm. right, with uh, our regular IT Absolutely. folks, right? And Absolutely. so we see it on the military side where we've brought those things together right. because it's operational, it's about how getting right. the mission done or the business outcomes for the organization. Yeah. Enablement and, of the tip of the you, spear. You are so on with that application and system security issue because, you know, I believe some of the reports I've been reading, still the largest number of, of, of threats and organizations are inside application. I mean, if someone wants to really manipulate your organization, they're going to do it inside application code. And that's inside Side the your your systems already. Um, in some cases, it's just poor quality code. I mean, or mistakes being made. You know, innocent mistakes being made, things like that. And there's so many tools out there to address that that are not, in my opinion, being fully u yeah, utilized. The other, the other thing, Jim, right, is that uh, even in the best uh, the best organizations, they do their code in a static analysis for security. But as we move to the cloud, right, and you're using agile development techniques, mm -hmm. you're going to be making. 10 to 30 changes to that application every day. Mm -hmm. Well, are we reviewing the scanning that code again? Right. A lot of work organized, so you're going to have to do it as a service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think so, um, you know, tools for application and system level security, quality, and, and, and assurance are going to become, again, another major push here to, uh, over the next several months because I don't think things like CDM or Einstein 3 address those issues at all. Uh, Paul, Chrisman, what do you think uh, in terms of uh, looking at some of the challenges that you think still need to be addressed and overcome? So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dovetail on the last couple of comments. And okay. We need to stop thinking of identities as belonging to applications. We need to start thinking about identities as a service. And we need to move the identities out of the applications into a single unified uh, service that's provided back to those uh, applications. That way we can control user access. That way we can centrally onboard and offboard people. Um, we can't do that application by application. And, and one of the things Earl was talking about is that rewriting of legacy applications, I'm going to respectfully disagree, we're going to have to bolt this on because we can't rewrite all these legacy applications and we need to move the identities out of the applications into a service, but then have that application co connectivity to the identity service that allows us to provide robust security to the application, even though the application wasn't written to think this way. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to solve that riddle and we're not going to be able to rewrite everything, but we're going to have to provide that strong, probably two or multi-factor authentication as a service back to those legacy applications. And then over time, the architecture will be in place and we will design modern applications, but we're going to have to deal with what we've got in the shop right now. So we need to move the, the uh, identities out of the applications and we need to make that service consumable for legacy yeah. applications. That's the biggest challenge right now. It's like the last mile. It's that last mile of connecting modern identity management back into legacy applications. I, I don't want to see a situation where you don't rewrite, and I think that's the key. Because there's a lot of other vulnerabilities other than you're right about the identity, but I don't want to see, because there's so many other issues that come with that. Right. But I'll tell you what, getting the identity right and getting identity yeah, and authentication right. in place is going to make a lot of other things easier to, to implement if you can get that accountability right. tied back to identity. You know. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time to cycle through. We're going to have refresh cycles on the applications, refresh cycles on the, the platforms that they run on. All of those things are going to happen, and it's going to get better, but we need to start right now with the realization that we can't forklift 
either Absolutely. remove or replace. Right. Um, so we have to have some sort of interim solution as we get to uh, the desired and state. And put the controls in place for what you know you can't yeah. forklift. I think that's the bigger challenge. You know, it's not like you can let something that you can't, you know, can't rewrite. You can't just let it have the same security mechanisms that that the other stuff has. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of times what we do. Yeah. You know, Paul too. You know, you mentioned last mile. I used to kiddingly switch that around and say the last mile really should be thought of as the first mile, because if if the last mile's out there and it, and it, there's vulnerabilities and it's insecure, you've got a hole in your network. Absolutely. So let's let's place. start let's start with you know that. You know. And as Earl was saying, you know, we're looking at transitioning applications to the to the cloud or in, into a mobile environment. If we start thinking about the platform where the application is going to run and work backwards from there, that's again uh, applying that analogy mm -hmm. of working backwards rather than forwards. But sometimes backwards is the way you need to go. Yeah. All right, folks. Let's talk about the future. We've got about 11 minutes left. Um, I need to hear from each of you about where all this is going, what what this means to us down the road, what it means to the country down the road. Let's uh, you know each have about a minute and a half or so to uh, articulate your your vision for, for for where this is going. Will we get to a point where we're proactive enough to get out in front of these threats, and uh, and so we'll be able to just uh, focus on doing our job, realizing the security is in place? I don't know, David. What's your crystal ball say? It looks like down the road. So I think it, it, we're looking a lot better than than we were just a couple of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. The information sharing is up. I think the information sharing is going to increase. I think that what we have to be able to do is to enable that uh, in a standards way as possible. And you're starting to see NIST, uh, they just submitted sticks and taxi to the OASIS um, uh, standards body, which is great because you're, what you're seeing is this kind of mix in, uh, between NIST and the government organizations. I also think that we do need to look at everybody as, as a digital citizen aspect and this training aspect that needs mm -hmm. to go forward. And the Internet of Things, there's no question. The numbers I saw in 2020, um, the, the data on the Internet of Things is going to go from 2 to 4 percent, which it is right now, to 40 percent of, of total data. So that is an astronomical growth from 2015 to 2020. So when you're looking at that, I think that you have to standardize uh, and commoditize everywhere you everywhere you can in the in the in the environment. Um, you know the the way you do your procedures, the way you do your uh, your training, all of these different types of things have to standardize. Just simply because you don't have time to go and spin your wheels on reinventing. Uh, reinventing things over and over again just to put your name on it. And yeah. I think the, uh, the military branches, DOD, uh, DHS, they really got that. And, uh, and the sharing has really upped that uh, from that perspective. So our enablement as Intel Security Group and as Intel of a standard security bus for those types of things, for changing that stuff, um, for changing that culture, helping to change that culture to where you can actually spend time on what matters is, is very important. Absolutely. Very well put. Good points there. Paul Chrisman, what, what's it look like for you down the road? Where's this all going? Well, um, I'm going to take two different tracks on this. Um, first, we've touched on this a little bit, but I think we're going to move steadily out of this idea of a passive defense, where it was mostly reactive and mm -hmm. mo mostly having to do with patching and vulnerability and, and dealing with what we already know. We're going to move away from this uh, passive defense into a more active defense. I agree. I, I, don't, I, I don't think we're going to move to offense, but we're going to move to active defense. And there's a big mind shift away from looking at objects and things to actions and actors. And that is a big shift into the future. Again, looking at things like continuous diagnostics and, sure. and monitoring. So that's on sort of on the technology side, broadly defined. On the identity side, I think we're going to come up with durable, trusted, interoperable identities. And mm -hmm. things like NSTIC is a, is a good move forward. Mm -hmm. It needs to be implemented. So we will have fewer identities, and those identities will be more reusable. They'll be more robust. They'll be more trustworthy. They'll mm -hmm. be more appropriate to the role that we perform. And that identity will be durable, and it will be trusted, and it will be interoperable, and it will be able to reduce the number of opportunities that people have to be compromised. Mm -hmm. So on, on two fronts, on the identity side, I think we're going to move forward with fewer identities. And on the technology side, I think we're going to move into this idea of an active defense. Excellent oh, no. point. Excellent point. Well said. Uh, Merle Matthews, what do you think? What does this look like down the road for you? Where's this all going? Yeah, I think this is something to, the world is not coming to an end here. I think we're on a good path. <laughs> yeah. And I think this, this We're going to block that digital yeah. hurricane. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the recognition, and I heard it from David and Paul, right? The attack vectors have really changed. And so, but the defense in depth model hasn't changed and it needs to change to keep up with the changing threat and so it, systems have to be more dynamically um, recognizable what those threats are it has to be predetermined actions already planned on your network so the machine learning on there 
you have to, and you have to have the trained personnel. And we come back, we've talked about this culture and trained train personnel. But what I really sh believe that organizations should be striving to achieve is an integrated defense solution that's compromised of several elements. Mm -hmm. um, working in a virtual environment, non-signature based uh, detection, right? So most people are using antivirus. Absolutely. Types. So that gets more to the active detection phase that Paul right. was talking about. You know, the endpoint security has to all come together, whether it's secure, you know, browsing, whether it's your encrypted database on your server, whether it's, you know, hardware interactions, um, rapid in, endpoint response, right? So we have to have better um, incident response capability. And then the final thing I would say is that we have to have dynamic threat intelligence sharing services, sure. mm -hmm. right? All that has to come together, but it's going to be more dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Some tough issues there, but they're, you're, you're right on. We need to get there. You want to make a comment on that, Dave? Yeah, I was going to say, that what, what, and exactly what they're saying, that autonomic hybrid environment, understanding that sometimes it's going to be on-prem, sometimes it's going to be in the cloud, and being able to manage it the same way and get that kind of operational data no matter where it's at. Right, you're not compromising by going to a different, uh, you know, <laughs> Thanks, David. Good point. Uh, Roger, what do you think, Roger Clark? Uh, what's this? Look, what's your crystal ball look like? What's it look like down the road? Where's this all well, going? I have to say I agree with a lot of things they're saying. We have to change the traditional mindset of signature-based uh, protect the pipe. It needs to move more into a tr uh, more of a uh, behavioral analytics uh, because you have to be able to develop those trend lines to be able to do the predictive right. analytics that will follow up. Mm -hmm. So you have to change that mindset. Also the mindset is more, it's about protecting the data and not necessarily the pipes or the endpoints. The data is the key. So selling, and you've got to keep talking to, for example, researchers. Researchers do things to um, get their information out and published, and you have to get them to recognize that, well, what happens to your data if somebody changes it and it's now got your name on it, and right. it's been changed. Right. So it's changing those mindsets, and I think we're making a lot of progress in those areas, but we've got to continue. Shared information is also, uh, I, I totally agree, getting those, developing sandboxes, uh, moving away from the static into that dynamic machine learning world is what we have to do, but we can't totally automate everything right. because there's too many different rule sets and mission sets that an automated response, I could accidentally knock off something that is, uh, yeah. you, you know, life and safety system that Absolutely. I can't knock off. Absolutely. It takes that human element uh, somewhere in the chain to, to make it all work. Uh, <clears throat> Rear Admiral uh, Marshall Lytle, let's talk about uh, what you see this uh, going down the road here. Where's this, where, where's this going as you work on your strategic planning for down the road? What, what's it look like to you? Well, the beauty of your going last is I can disagree with everything everybody else already <laughs> said. <laughs> ditto. So, ditto. But uh, I think as mine, as with theirs, our vision for the future is really a safe, secure, and resilient cyberspace, mm -hmm. not only for the government, but for all of our industry partners, the sector partners, and people in general, personal, personal use of the Internet. We've got to get to that position. And it's an organizational imperative that we have the right personnel, tools, and training to operate effectively in this cyber environment, not just on the defense side, but on the, just the basic business operation side. We've got to get there. Our, act, our, uh, our adversaries in this space are agile, and they're adaptable. And as was mentioned, they're working together against us. They can crowdsource attacks. It's an interesting uh, concept. And we need to be that same way. We need to be able to operate systems to mitigate those cyber threats before they're realized. And that gets to kind of the automatic, uh, automatic recognitions of these threats. We're going to get there. We're starting to work together as government. We're starting to work together as industry. The light bulb is going on about the culture aspect that we really, really need to pay attention to this. And as that light bulb comes on, that's just going to generate more interaction and sharing as we realize is that that wire going down the, going down the road, that piece of fiber that's underneath the ocean, is carrying your grandmother's email, it's carrying our critical business information, critical government information, and it's all mixed together. Right, right. And we have to realize we're sharing the same domain with our adversaries, and we're getting there. Absolutely. Well said. Well, well put. Okay, let me do my best to try to do some summarizing here. I take notes uh, and take a shot at some of the key things I think I heard. On progress, uh, some things that resonated with me were the fact that the cybersecurity, we've got to make sure we get the scope right here. It's not, it's not this. It's a, 
a big issue, and, and it, it, it includes operations and a lot of other things. And cyber, and we need to to enable operations. Cybersecurity needs to be an enabler. Uh, continuous assessments are important. We have to constantly be looking at what we're doing. There is no start and end. Uh, we need to be proactive versus reactive, or move towards becoming more proactive. And standards are going to be important. Uh, you know, we need to standardize uh, wherever that's possible. Some of the specific programs I heard about were the Commerce uh, ESOC, which uh, obviously is a, a, a real success story. I heard about organization change in Cyber Command and how Coast Guard is actually reorganizing to address this, and the big CDM program that's out there today. Um, when we talk lessons learned, we talked about the culture change issue and the fact that it's going to take some organizational change. People are a big part of this. User responsibilities are a part of this. The workforce is a big part of this. Uh, we talked about communication with stakeholders being a, a big part of this. You can't do it alone. We talked about collaboration. We talked about no silver bullets. You really need to think this through in, in multiple different ways. When we talk challenges, we talked about uh, silos are still out there. Funding and resources are a challenge. The workforce and getting the right people. And uh, it was brought up about application security that uh, we can't forget about that because still a large percentage of the threats are in application uh, areas. As we look towards the future, we talked about the fact that we are getting better. Um, you know, it, it, uh, all of a sudden, cybersecurity is being talked about at the highest levels of government. It is now a top priority. We are getting better. We need to get better. But there is a long way to go. Um, I like the uh, the concept of digital citizens, where everyone is responsible, and it's not going to just be you know uh, a government agency or multiple agencies or companies. This this particular matter to be addressed uh, by our country is going to require uh, every individual to be to be a part of it. And the idea of going from passive to active wherever we can, we can't just fix things when they break. We can't wait for something bad to happen and then fund it and, and look for a fix. We got to anticipate what those bad things may, may be in advance. Uh, with that, I want to thank all of our panelists from taking time from their busy schedule. It was a fascinating conversation. I'm, I love these uh, shows because I feel like you guys make me smart, you know, because <laughs> you all have uh, so many different perspectives on this. So thanks for our panelists for taking time from your busy schedules. Thanks for our sponsors for, uh, you know, uh, doing the show with us and, and sending some of your best people in this subject matter experts to be with us. Uh, without you, we don't have a show. Um, thanks to our, the good people here at Federal News Radio, who always do such a tremendous job accommodating us here. And finally, thanks to our listening audience out there who uh, tunes into the show each time. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.